thanks, Mitra, and thanks everybody for coming to this session on measuring the impact of design systems. So as Mitra mentioned, design systems are pretty much ubiquitous nowadays. Every design team either has one or is making the case to have one. And you really can't have, you really can't scale your product offerings and build coherent experiences for your customers without a design system. So by way of definition, a design system is a set of tools such as components or templates, but also it's the guidelines, the processes, the philosophies for really creating your company's digital assets and your digital estate uh, in a reliable and in a reusable fashion. Having a design system enables faster time to market. It makes product development more systematic. It also ensures product alignment across all of your customer touch points. And ultimately, it just gives us more time and space to really think about the truly hard and innovative problems that the business wants or needs to solve. Um, personally, since 2008, uh, I've you know been privy to various stages of, of the design system kind of maturity life cycle, uh, and more recently leading product and design at Lab49, which is a boutique capital markets consultancy. Um, I've seen many implementations of design systems at organizations that um, also have different degrees of design maturity and also you know, those implementations have varying degrees of, of success. There are definitely many pitfalls along the way. Creating a design system is time consuming, it's a costly investment, and the value of design systems is really only realized when the product teams across the organization adopt it and really become part of the community that evangelizes it and, and builds upon it. An interesting thing I like to think about um, design systems is that they're really like a living product and the design system you have today may look very different um, two years from now. So for this reason, I'm super excited to have this diverse panel of design, design ops, product leaders at various stages of that design maturity spectrum that I talked about also across financial industry and the platforms that really support the product development for these organizations. As the moderator, I'll just guide us through the process. As Mitra mentioned, I'm planning to cover two, two topics. The first one is how to manage design systems like a product, not a project, and really plan and measure for impact from day one. And second, how that next wave of tooling innovation is blurring the lines you know, enabling further automation uh, between design and development. So we have a short time to really talk about this, less than 30 minutes. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in with a, a little game and some intros for our panelists. So first, the, the game, the audience can feel free to jump in. I'm not sure if the chat feature is live, but if it is, um, for the panelists, if you could just write down one word on a piece of paper and just, feel free to be a little creative. Um, that word should describe the impact that you've been able to achieve or that you're planning to achieve with design systems at your organization. And I'll just give you a few seconds to write that down. And on the count of three, if you could just reveal your word. One, two, three. Nice, so we have scale, impending, communication, and efficiency. Awesome, I wanna jump into that a little bit. So let me start with Deborah. Um, I'll just quickly give you an introduction. Deborah Hirschman is head of corporate and investment bank uh, user experience at JP Morgan. She's responsible for ensuring that clients really receive that best in class user experience across their trading platforms and also uh, for lowering the cost of execution, both for, for the bank and for their clients. So I first actually met Deborah a couple of years ago, uh, just by way of, of giving you a little background. And in that first meeting, she kind of shared this annual report of what she'd been able to do with the user experience organization. I was just amazed, honestly, by what she'd been able to accomplish in two short years and also just with how well that was positioned from a business and, and impact metrics perspective. 
So I'm really excited to, to learn more about her journey with design systems. And can you share your word, Deborah, and tell us a little bit about why you picked it? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, my word is scale. Um, I like the words that the other panelists showed as well. There's always um, different angles to look at this. I picked scale because um, my area of J.P. Morgan Chase is pretty large. We're a, a, an organization that's got over 50,000 people in it, um, around 20,000 developers. So my team is pretty small. It's a drop in the bucket there. So um, really nice size for a design team. We're at about 150 or so people, which is a really nice size design organization, but we're a drop in the bucket when it comes to all of the things that are being designed and built at JP Morgan. We're not even involved with many of the things that are being built just because of the size of the team. So um, scale is something that is always at play at JP Morgan, just because we're just such a large institution and a global institution. Um, and so one of the ways that I was able to achieve scale across my team was by reuse of the design language as the default starting point for the designs. And more importantly, using it as a mechanism for scale across the product and development organization. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that, um, you know, scale. Uh, and also just team size question, you know, how many designers and product people do you mm -hmm. have compared to your engineers? Right. So, so next knowing, I'm gonna go, oh, go ahead. So just to wrap up, so knowing that we're never gonna have the ratio that people will say makes sense for designers and developers, we're not gonna have a team of thousands of user experience designers, right? That's why we really needed to have a solution for scale. And so this is one of them. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. Yuki, I'm going to go with you next. Yuki is the VP of product at Figma, which, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer has revolutionized the way product teams collaborate around, you know, real time design. And their tool really supports the design process, not just designers and, and moves the feedback loop and the collaboration loop increasingly to the left. I met Yuki just a couple of weeks ago, but just during our chat was immediately drawn to his passion around community, collaboration, and just the promise of some of the innovations they're working on to really uh, accelerate and augment uh, the design and development life cycle. So Yuki, could you share your word and why you picked it? Sure, yeah, I couldn't find a Sharpie, so I had to go with the digital representation, but um, yes, yeah, so I chose the word communication and I thought about it both from the perspective of Figma internally and how we use design systems as well as how we've seen our customers use it. And what I really think is that design without design systems is like a world without language. Mm -hmm. And you know, designers can communicate faster with design systems because they're just not constantly reinventing the wheels. You know, they're not pushing pixels anymore. They're able to really push ideas with these larger constructs. Um, and as Deborah was alluding to, designers can also communicate with engineers because now they're speaking in common abstractions. And so the handoffs don't have to be about these individual pixels or paddings or color, um, but rather more up-leveled constructs. And so that's kind of why I think of it as, you know, as language and all these things, you know, result in um, everyone speaking the same language. And as a result, just more, more efficiencies gained or to Deborah's point, more scale um, because people aren't wasting their time trying to communicate kind of these lower level things um, that kind of take a lot of time to get aligned on. And, you know, there's a lot more that you can kind of miss when there's so much information you have to convey. Yeah, I really like that analogy. And I've definitely seen it at organizations where design systems have taken off, you know, where people are just speaking the same language and, you know, CSS and also just the, from a design perspective and the visual style. So I love that. Um, I'm going to go now to Evan Jones. Um, he introduced him briefly, but he's the VP of design at OpenFin. OpenFin, I think, is a household name probably for everybody at this conference. Um, they're on the cutting edge of web technologies. And I think it was interesting for me to learn when we met that they're just getting started on their design maturity journey. Evan joined about five months ago. He's in the process of building a team of researchers, strategists and designers, and naturally that design system for them to you know, communicate and collaborate around. 
So Evan, could you share with us the word you picked and why? Yeah, of course. Um, I chose impending, obviously, because our design system is forthcoming. Um, uh, but I guess on the complete and utter flip side of what uh, Deborah spoke to in terms of scale, we are uh, attempting to scale a system um, which takes into account um, OpenFin's position at the base of a lot of, um, well, many of the largest financial institutions in the world, as well as um, smaller and medium sized uh, firms. And what we've been witnessing is um, a lot of these sort of inconsistencies and inefficiencies in design languages across institutions, not necessarily at the larger institutions, of course, who have these huge teams, um, and trying to observe those um, inefficiencies and sort of pull them together into a uh, system of interfaces that we can provide them um, so they can free up resources to focus on the more technical problems that they're solving at their, at their organizations. Yeah, that makes sense. And last but not least, Dave Malouf. He heads up strategy and designs op design ops at Northwestern Mutual. He's a big voice in the community, uh, just elevating the role of, of design ops in an organization. And day to day, that, that really means kind of empowering designers and, and amplifying their creativity and impact at scale. I'm curious uh, about your word, Dave, and why you picked it. Sure, my word was uh, efficiency. And I think I chose it because of the way that I was thinking about the question, but I think like what we've accomplished so far um, mm -hmm. with our design system is definitely uh, a finding efficiencies. So we've been able to, for the teams that have adopted our design system, we've been able to five, 10 X efficiency uh, with those teams. So they are working at a much faster rate than before. Um, they're also working with less mistakes uh, than before. So there's less refactoring, less recoding, um, and less design QA involved uh, with it, within those product teams. From a design perspective, it's also allowed us to focus who the designers are that we hire. Um, so a lot of the visual design, high craft visual design is lifted by the design system. And so we can focus our designers um, in terms of the ratio of visual design to more architectural uh, interaction designers and lean it more towards interaction design than we've had before. So it's changed, uh, it's allowed us to be more efficient. We used to have to double up all of our designers and now we get to focus our designers more on interaction design. Yeah, I think that's a great breakdown of the term efficiency and what it can mean from a design system standpoint. I definitely look forward to hearing more about those metrics you mentioned in the next segment. So now that we have a better sense of just the breadth of perspectives that we have on the panel, I'd really like to ground us on the product development cycle. Like one of the biggest recommendations that, that we have and that I've seen just with uh, just trying to get design systems off the ground is to really treat them like a product and, and not a project. Um, a product, by that, I mean, a product has an investment case, you know, with clear ROI metrics. It has a product development team. It has a tight feedback loop with users. And there's all the sales and marketing that goes, you know, into just getting people to actually adopt a product. And then just uh, thinking about the product up updates that are going to ensure, you know, long-term engagement with that product. A project really is something that kind of has a beginning and end and anything that you're doing uh, against that project is really debt uh, or is perceived as debt afterwards. So um, kind of, as we said earlier at the beginning, you know, uh, design system is not an end in and of itself. The goal isn't just to have a design system. It's the words and, and things and the, the impact that we just learned about. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Deborah. Uh, I thought it was really interesting, you know, how you thought about scale. And uh, I'm wondering, how did you frame, like in that investment period, how did you frame um, the investment in a design system as really a tool for solving some of those bigger business challenges? And were there any quantitative measures, you know, that really resonated with the business? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that I would say is um, I really needed to start I, I needed to do some homework and actually create some some visible assets so that people could understand what we were talking about. And the way that I um, typically, um, if I can use the word pitch, the the 
um, creation of the design language was threefold. So the first one was from a JP Morgan brand identity perspective. So we've got a lot of competition and the premise here was that everything that we deliver should come across as one firm um, and not from a bunch of groups within, a, within one firm that didn't really communicate with each other. So the idea being that you could step three feet back from your monitor, look at everything that was on your screen and know which assets came from JP Morgan. Um, so that brand equity was important. It's a little bit hard to measure, but the way that I showed this is kind of the before and after. So I've got a big compilation of applications that were delivered to clients by JP Morgan years ago. And you can see that they're all different. They've all got a different look and feel. They've all got a different kind of brand identity execution. And more importantly, which will lead to the second one, they're all built with different technologies and have different nuance to the way that people interact with them. Um, the second case that I make is probably the most important, which is our clients should experience a seamless and integrated experience that they feel is delivered by a best in class company because it really reinforces the trust that they have in the company. Um, and so in that regard, when we talk about things like being seamless or feeling integrated, we've got a program of work now to start measuring um, more than we have in the past, customer experience metrics. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of metrics will be really helpful in proving the value of a more uniform, consistent, compliant, branded JP Morgan experience across all of our properties. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, which is probably easiest to quantify, is the efficiency angle that Dave was mentioning. So efficiency across designers, but again, coming back to the idea of scale, efficiency across the literally more than 10,000 developers who we have at the company who are probably gonna to touch this design language and toolkit in some regard. And so that's a place where we're able to actually track reuse. We know who's using the component tree. We know who will eventually be using the patterns. From my design team's perspective, we can tell reuse as well. And that's where we can start actually measuring and quantifying the savings on the efficiency that we're getting through the toolkit. So again, it was the JP Morgan brand identity, the client facing benefits, and then the efficiency developers and designers um, achieve internally through use of the componentry on the toolkit and design language. And were those quantifiable? Like, I'm really curious about the customer experience metrics and, and how you're thinking about quantifying those. Um, we're going to, it's easier to do that at a product level. Yeah. Um, where it's gonna be a little bit harder is to say, okay, because of this seamless and more integrated experience we're able to achieve, how do we quantify that? So actually it's something that we're trying to figure out what, right now, both from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. Yeah. Um, so the brand identity I think is hardest. The client yeah. experience will probably be more attitudinal um, mm -hmm. that we'll be measuring. And then from an efficiency perspective, that's where we can really get the quantifiable results. Yeah, sounds like efficiency is a first order uh, impact on design systems. And then these other ones are, you know, second and third order, which sounds great. Evan, I'm curious, how, how does that differ from your experience kind of leading this effort in an environment where the design maturity, the maturity is just a lot more emerging, as you said, or impending? Yeah, uh, it's um, it's similar in, in, in a strange way. We, we obviously have a team of six or a much smaller team than, than Deborah's, but um, we interface with so many different institutions that we're sort of building for many, many, many developers. So we're trying to constantly look for um, savings and resource time management for these institutions so that we can provide them interfaces and front ends so they don't have to essentially focus on those things. Um, but again, because we're so nascent, nascent um, we're, we're, we actually are in a fortunate position of being able to engineer a solution from scratch so that we have a sort of choosing of the various resources that have sprung up in the last 10 years, as you mentioned, around design systems. Um, so we may be more constrained with uh, like a team dynamic, but uh, we have some agility in the deployment of our resources. Um, and just the way we've been thinking about design systems as an implementation, because um, what we're doing is sort of like threading um, different dots between institutions and trying to figure out what is similar and, and, and needed. Um, we have an opportunity to sort of design to the nth degree of detail, um, perhaps sort of luxuriously, 
uh, we're not necessarily focusing on like common elements, but we're focusing on things like keyboard commands, common languages around how um, users interact with their machines in a way that we, we have a sort of um, very grand dream of creating a sort of language akin to Bloomberg terminal for as many different institutions as possible that sort of common like creates commonality of people being able to move between institutions um, to, like and they can kind of get up and running in seconds based on the language they've kind of come to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but from the perspective, calculating value is obviously very difficult. So we're much more in the sort of um, qualitative um, space at the moment. Um, we don't have a, anything necessarily that can be quantified. So a lot of what we're doing is setting up an enormous amount of client meetings where we're making we're meeting every two weeks with clients to try and understand their um, needs and even as Deborah says that a team of 100 to 20,000 developers is a difficult ratio to manage even when you have scale um, we're finding that a lot of institutions have you know maybe one UX designer if not less at the slightly lower tier or smaller tier uh, institutions um, and so freeing up and like design time in that regard is a uh, you know, high value thing for these organizations and we're trying to sort of massively capitalize on that from our design systems um, point of view. Yeah, it sounds like a fun problem because you guys are kind of like an open system, like an open, like an OS basically for, right. for the financial industry. And uh, it's a big problem and makes sense to start with, you know, user, good, good user research. Um, Dave, I know you, when we met, you had kind of a unique business case for thinking about design systems. And when you pitch design systems, um, it was around, I think, accessibility for your very diverse retail audience. I'm curious, did you have like moving on to kind of like the MVP phase, you know, let's say you've gotten some kind of buy-in, were there any early wins that really helped to prove this as a winning strategy? Well, I mean, it wasn't our starting point. Our starting point was definitely an, an efficiency um, and quality starting point when we initially built out a small team. Uh, when it was time to really invest um, in the team, we did prove out the efficiency previously, but that wasn't enough to get the size of the investment that we wanted. And so we needed to really look more holistically at what the business was facing uh, from a user experience perspective, from a design perspective, from a development perspective that we felt the design system could really impact. And one of the areas that we uh, found um, that really spoke to a, a risk averse uh, industry such as insurance, um, that uh, accessibility uh, jumped to the fore. Um, every uh, organization out there today that has a substantial um, size and a substantial market in um, in any kind of open sector is open to litigation um, if they don't meet certain standards of quality uh, and show certain standards of progress. And so this is was an easy sell, quite honestly, for our organization once we made the case and showed the history, the recent history uh, related to accessibility. Um, but it also really spoke to our organization's values um, in that we are an organization dedicated to uh, inclusion uh, for all of our customers. We're also a life insurance company and you have to imagine that life insurance does speak to a growing aging population as well as a young population. And we all are in need of different levels of support and augmentation as we grow older. Um, and so it's not a question of 18% of people, it's 100% of people um, in, in our world. So, yeah. Yeah, agreed. I love the concept of universal design and how taking these measures, you know, really makes it better for everyone in the end. And the, the alignment to, to the values and the, the actual clientele and, and customer segments that you're dealing with. Um, I guess getting, I, I mean, I'm just wondering like, Dave, were, were there any obstacles um, that you overcame once you kind of went down, you know, the journey? I'm thinking of like, you know, business silos or any of the marketing efforts really just to just kind of start getting that initial proof of, um, you know, what the investment case was to back up your investment case? I think that there's 
uh, there are always issues where uh, trying to do something at an enterprise-wide level in any organization is going to find hiccups across the way. Um, you have people who have a way of doing things that they're used to and a design system, no matter how open you try to do it, is asking people to change the way that they work. And so, you know, I think adoption is generally an issue across the board for different product groups. And that problem is not just a developer problem, that's also a designer problem. So it, it works in both directions. Uh, in, in that way, we've, we've found. Um, I will admit, left so on the designer side, uh, A, we're a smaller group, just like Deborah was saying, we're, we're much less than our engineering partners. Um, but I think the other thing is that when you talk about change, you're talking about legacy, and legacy is another fancy word for te tech debt, and you need to pay it back, and someone needs to have the budget to pay it back, and while we can put resources towards making the design system, we can't always put the budget forward for the product groups to actually implement what they need to do to make the design system work. So that's another area that uh, we don't control on our side. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of collaboration between different groups and also just upskilling. I think it is true that designers, you know, aren't. Uh, always thinking about things and in, in design in a systematic way. And, um, and certainly, you know, this brings developers much closer to the design process. Yuki, at Figma, there's a, you know, you guys think deeply about this stuff and um, think about, you know, how to improve that collaboration between product teams. Are there any signals or metrics that you've found particularly useful for measuring adoption of design systems and just the impact uh, overall that design can have in the organization? Yeah, I mean, many of our customers asked us about the, how to measure their impact. And one of the things we decided to build was a feature called design system analytics to try to, try to help answer this. And the idea being that, you know, all your designs and design systems are in the cloud. So we can tell you exactly how your design systems are being used by which team, by which product, on which files and things like that. And um, you know, I think as part of this, you know, you do start to get an understanding of at least kind of from the designer's perspective, um, you know, which components people are feeling are uh, really useful or some patterns we see, for example, are people are willingly using a lot of buttons and these like really atomic units, but maybe not using some of these composite uh, things like a card with two buttons and things like that. And you start to see where there's more uh, room for efficiencies because you can kind of start to introduce kind of higher level concepts or, um, when I was at Uber, for example, we had this mandate um, to stop designing an iOS and start designing Android because that represented our population. And oftentimes now people can see very clearly, oh, actually most of, most design teams are still continuing to use more iOS libraries and Android libraries. And that's kind of an opportunity to kind of like help shift that culturally. Um, or another one, and the last one is kind of like, um, you know, when people start using your components, we also track when they break it apart. We call it detaching in Figma, but and that kind of helps uh, the design systems person get feedback that okay, your component was kind of useful, but not quite. And now you start to get that uh, in the form of data. Um, and so those are some things that help at least on kind of like the adoption side, as well as how to make the system better, which hopefully drives some of the more efficiencies. Yeah, um, Deborah, on the on the growth side, what, what are some of the most important things you did to kind of enable that um, adoption and kind of see the growing usage of the design system within your org? Yeah, I would say that's probably equally important to having built the thing in the first place is to really treat it as a product. So um, a few other things that we did were, first of all, we wanted the, the delivery channel. So the, the site that was providing toolkit documentation and component tree and so on to really be best in class. And so we really spent a lot of time working on the documentation and also the storytelling around the design language. Um, we had a series of educational events, which continue now. Um, within the design team, of course, we did them, but we really wanted to get out in a federated way across the organization and upskill people. So that was something that we launched. We also made sure to really have people feel 
involved and try to create an inclusive environment around the toolkit. Not that it was like our property and we were forcing it onto you, but really create um, stakeholder investment and make sure that we involved a lot of people from the design, um, the design and uh, more importantly, the engineering community. So they would really feel like they had skin in the game. Um, yeah. The marketing and communications around this was really important and trying to find the right balance but between communicating in the right way, not promising things that didn't exist, but still getting people very excited and enthusiastic about it. Um, and one of the things that we always try to do is to highlight the, the um, component contributors because we want people to start feeding more componentry contributions back into the toolkit. And so we were trying to highlight greatest contributors as well as best in class applications that were using the toolkit. Um, and then finally, I would say the support was really important. So we started doing support from within the core toolkit team, but very quickly realized that it wasn't going to scale. And so we're using Symphony and other channels to create a, a, a community of support where the engineering community actually is, is, creates a self-supporting organization. And so we've got about 2,500 developers in a Symphony chat room right now who are supporting each other and sharing their experience with the toolkit. So I would really say managing it as a product and not just a, a tool for designers is really, really important for adoption. That's really cool. I'm realizing we just have a couple of minutes left actually. So I'm gonna just try to leave you guys with some closing thoughts and I'm gonna, hand it over to Evan, if you could, if there's one thing that you'd like this audience to, to take away from the session, what, what would it be? Uh, I don't, I guess I could be tongue in cheek and say, um, uh, measure twice, cut once. I think uh, it's obvious amongst the group here that we're being very um, careful with how we understand um, not only how designers are implementing designs through their design system, but the, uh, there's a common thread here of people really understanding the um, way users interact with the designs and how that informs the entire process. So I think um, measuring that is as important as actually implementing the thing at the, at the end state. Yuki, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we heard a lot today about how design systems is you know, kind of the one area where you can actually measure impact in many different ways. In design, we always struggle to measure impact of our experiences because it's so removed sometimes from business metrics. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think mm -hmm. my takeaway is just like, there's still a lot of innovation that's happening and a lot more of that, you know, needs to happen. And, you know, I think design systems kind of used to be this documentation or guide that you published and you kind of like hope that everyone would like adhere to it. And now, you know, I think you can, programmatically analyze your designs and like treat it as data. Uh, and, you know, a lot of our specific sophisticated customers are starting to, you know, use APIs to just like analyze it and see what's happening. And I think there's so much more we can be doing here and so much creativity we can do now that kind of design is turning a little bit more into structured data. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to see what the industry does there. Yeah, me too. I think it's a really exciting space. Dave, anything you'd like to leave us with? Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, I was going to say as um, sort of a design operations focused person, um, design systems are an operational tool, but they're also another part of the system that need to be operationalized. And so it's really important to think about how they connect with other parts of the system, such as how does, how does contribution to design actually map to the rest of a DevOps kind of way of working as well. Um, what are the ways that the tools that we use, um, the tools that we need to create even have to operate and work in order to uh, find opportunities for efficiency and quality maintenance um, through the system. So there's, there's so many opportunities once you have this, this product, this system to work with, to even find more efficiencies and to um, through operate op, treating it like an operational um, tool. Challenge. Yeah, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Deborah, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, I would just say have fun with it. It's hard stuff to do. Yeah. Um, but 
it's really cool, right? As it's you're creating a puzzle for other people to put together and helping them figure out how to do it. So um, it's a lot of hard work and um, enjoy it along the way. Yeah, it's definitely complex, but foundational. And I really appreciate the panelists for, for joining us today and sharing your journey and experience on this topic and also for everybody who joined us. I think um, just to close this out, I think Mitra um, added the Q&A panel will be live after this session. Feel free to join us if you have any more questions. And thanks everybody for, for coming. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. As Yvonne mentioned.